Okay, I will be reading Mark chapter 10, verses 46 and 52. Again, that's Mark chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. And it says, Then they came to Jericho, and Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, leaving the city, a land named a land and blind man, Artemis, and the son of Phineas, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Mary rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling to you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind, the blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Thank you, Josiah. Lots of good things coming up, isn't it? You get to eat candy all week. <laughs> uh, it's going to be a good time at the Harvest Festival, and I hope you're listening to Joshua as he announced about the week that we have. Uh, you'll have a lot of fun if you come. Bring your kids. We'll get to share with some of the neighborhood kids, and that'll be a great thing. And then Mission Sundays in a couple of weeks, you can see some of the banners that they're putting up about some of the work that's been done and going to be done. And so that's going to be an exciting time for us as well. Always a lot of good things. So I want to talk today about calling for help. What does that mean? What's it like? What do you do? I think this is, this is one of the things that maybe has caused us to have difficulty in our time. Uh, because it gets confusing. But let's go back and look at what the Bible really talks about. The passage that he's read to us today talks about Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus is on the road from Jericho up to Jerusalem. Jesus was traveling along that road. And so he, uh, Bartimaeus is one of those people who's along there. Um, Jesus had just been talking about being a servant, about what it means, and Peter and John had said, well, we'll be the first servants. We'll sit on the right and the left, and uh, they were wanting the first places of honor, and so he has to deal with that among his disciples, of, you know, always wanting to be first, and so as he's leaving and going toward Jerusalem, Bartimaeus is sitting on the side of the road, and he hears, and he understands, and he knows who Jesus is. I'm not sure how he got the knowledge, or maybe he just hears the gossip. The people are talking around about who Jesus is, and so he cries out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. It's a call for help. It's a call just to say, I need your help. And so he does call to Jesus. He does ask for help. But, you know, the first time, Jesus didn't turn around. So he calls again, and he calls again, and he calls again, and louder, and louder, and louder, and uh, now it's getting annoying. People are saying, why don't you watch? Don't bother him. He's on the way, and we're, we're listening to what he's saying now, and, and you're better watching. Did you ever feel like that? When you needed help, that maybe you were the interruption. The people around didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to listen to you. And you just felt like, well, I feel like I'm, I'm the one needing help, but I'm having to ask and I'm having to interrupt everybody else. And, you know, if I just didn't say anything, they'd be just fine to go on without it. But that's not what Jesus does. Jesus stops. He hears him. And then, oddly enough, he says, all right. Well, Jesus is blind. Do you not know that? And he's over there and he's blind. He can hear him. And he says, you know, call him. Tell him to come. And so Jesus stays right where he is. And Barnabas has to jump up from where the place where he's been sitting. It's not good to just sit and say, help, help, help. I need help. And Jesus says, no, I'm going to stay here. You come to me if you want. 
And sure enough, that's what happens. He jumps up. He's excited now. He's got the attention of Jesus. And so he comes over to where Jesus is. And the odd thing about this is Jesus asks the question, what do you want me to do for you? I wouldn't be ready for that question. What do you want me to do for you? Well, I want you to fix everything. Make me happy. Make my life wonderful. That's what I want you to do for me, is to do everything. You know, make me able to see, first of all, make sure I've got good health. But then if I see I can't sit by the road and beg, so I'm going to need a job. And it'd be nice if I had a wife, and you find me one of those, and maybe some kids, and I need a car, and I'm going to need a cell phone. Because after all, how else we communicate here? And so it almost it doesn't ask that at all. It's like Jesus is saying, what's the one thing you want me to do for you? He isn't saying, just, well, let me fix everything in your life. I don't think he had that attention. I don't think Jesus had that attention. But I think sometimes today we have that attention. And if God has not come into our life somehow and fixed absolutely everything that makes us the least, slightest little bit unhappy or uncomfortable, then, well, God, you're just not doing your job. I mean, after all, we need... And what do you need? And I think it's a real misunderstanding of where God is. And I think it does something to us in how we ask for help. And then we see it get misused sometimes with people who are that way and who are just always asking for everything. And then we back off and say, well, then, then we don't really want to ask for help. I can do it all myself. And I don't want to bother anybody. I don't want to get in the way. And so I won't ask for help. And so the only people that ask for help are the ones that seem to want more support. Let's go back to this and look at what this is all about. Because if you look at the passage and look at what he's really trying to say, Jesus heals him. He does say, you know, I want, to, I want to see. I want to regain my sight. And so if you go back, you look at this and he says, go your way. Your faith has made you well. I like that answer. Your faith is what it made you well. He is not healed because of his need. He's not healed because he's blind and pitiful and terrible and awful. And, and he's healed, healed because of his faith. What does that mean? Well, he's healed not because of his need, but not because of Jesus' pity on him, because of his faith. Because he believes, first of all, that Jesus is able to do that. That's why he's calling for help. He knows Jesus, Son of God, is able to do this. He calls him also Son of David. So he knows who Jesus is. He knows he's Messiah. He knows he's the next one to sit on that throne of David. And all of this is one huge confession on his part, being able to say, you know, I understand who you are, and I know who you are, and I believe in who you are, that you are the Messiah. You are the one who's come into this world. And he knows specifically what he wants. He doesn't ask for everything. And he didn't ask for long-term support. He says, this is what I need. I want to see. And Jesus says, your faith made you well. And the faith is followed by appreciation. You see, if it isn't by faith, then sometimes it's not followed by appreciation, but faith is followed by appreciation. And he says, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And for the first time, he disobeys that. He doesn't go his way. He follows Jesus. And he keeps with Jesus. And he stays with Jesus. And Jesus comes to Bethany and then to Bethany. And then he crests the top of the hill. And he says, go find me a donkey. And he sits on top of the donkey. And he rides into Jerusalem with the triumphal entry. It makes me wonder if Bartimaeus wasn't right there at that time. Going down the hill in triumph with Jesus. This is Messiah. Hosanna to his name as he cries out because 
truly his life is spent trying. And he's seen what Jesus is able to do. And the way the text reads, it looks as if it goes all the way through there like that. And so he has something to rejoice. It's always bothered me why Jesus didn't help more people. And I'm sure we don't have it all recorded. I'm sure there's many more people that he helped than what we have recorded. I'm sure there's a lot more miracles. It says the Bible couldn't contain all the things that he did and all the things that he taught. And, and you know, so I'm sure there's a lot more that we have. But at the same time, you look at the way it happened back then, and it's very interesting. Because it's like Jesus healed this person's lameness, this person's blindness. And always is the, in that whole thing is the admission of, here I am, I have this problem, I cry for help. And then Jesus responds to that. And so you're able to see that happen. When the woman who had, was on her period for 12 years and has the issue of blood, she tries to come up behind Jesus and just touch him because she believes, once again, it's her faith. And Jesus turns around and says, oh, no, you don't. No, that's my paraphrase. Sorry, that's not really in the text. But he turns around and says, this is what it's about. I, who touched me? And so she has to then tell about what the time was, what the disease was, and that she was healed. That's kind of an embarrassing thing. You know? We, all they have to see do is say female problems and the guy is so enough said we don't want to know that's okay but Jesus points her out and says no you need to tell everybody because you've been healed by God and there's this tremendous appreciation that comes because of where she is and because of what she's been able to do but Jesus doesn't seem to give support as in a long-term thing, of, well, and I'll heal you tomorrow, and if you have anything else, come back, and I'll heal that. No, it's, I did one. It's just very interesting they didn't do that. I saw this. Everyone, no matter how big and how strong, can use a little help sometimes. Never be afraid to ask for help when you need it. What are we here for, if not for each other? I think that's really true. The big ship can go like crazy. It can sail across the ocean. It can carry lots of cargo or lots of people. But when it gets to port, it needs to go. Because it doesn't get into the dock very easily. Its engines are made for running. And all the rest of us are like this as well. We may have things that we do great. But there are some times when we need help. And I think this is one of the most important things that you see in the early church. I kind of think we've got to a critical place now where the people who really need help don't ask for help. And I think that's done something bad to us. Because this is one of my faults, all right? I think I can do it myself. Do you guys ever think that way? Thank you for the laugh. She knows it's true, that's why. I'll do everything possible to do it myself. And it's been this way since I was, I think, two years old. You know, you get the two-year old. I do it myself. I dress myself. I do myself. And that has come up to be our culture, our way of life, our way of doing things. No, I don't need any help. I'll help you, but I don't need any help. And we don't make any relationships either. And we don't share the joy of that work. And we don't share that somebody else is able to come and have compassion for us. And somebody else is able to come and actually feel good about helping us. And we've cut that off because I can do it myself. And there's some times when people really do need the help, but they don't want to admit it. And so I think we don't have the same culture as the early church did. Because we don't want to say we need help. We don't want people to think we couldn't do it. We don't want them to think we're vulnerable. So we don't see people of faith asking. We don't see God's response of faith being given to people. 
That's just where we are. And so I think maybe we need to look at this a lot more and be able to think about this. That he says, your faith has made you well, and being able to ask for help is a matter of faith. It's believing that God is out there, believing that some people are there to be able to help, but that God is on that track. He has that for us, and that we are able to trust and depend on him and on other people that are his people, and that was the culture of the early church. But now it's more, well, if you have to have help, you know, maybe we'll you know, do something. If you just absolutely can't do it by yourself, can't you pay somebody to do it? And so the culture's gone. We don't have that sharing of everything that you see in the second chapter of Acts and in the fourth chapter of Acts that they had common possessions and they shared everything with them. No, we don't do that. It's just not even where we are. So when do you call for help? At some point you might need it. Maybe now. It's just the last thing before you go under. Certainly not until we need it, not until everything has gone wrong. And then sometimes that's when we've disobeyed and everything has gone wrong because it's really our fault because we did it wrong in the first place. And so now God has sent punishment on us and we don't want people to, yeah, it's because of ourselves. I find it very interesting that we don't want to ask until it's almost too late. You know, you don't ever have somebody say, well, I need rent before they've got the eviction notice. They always wait till at least that. Well, I need lights. Well, okay. And the power's already been shut off, so there's the penalty that you have to pay there as well. We don't want to ask. We don't want to say. We don't want to do any of that. So we tend not to help until it's an emergency and we know they're not going to help till it's an emergency and so we're not going to ask until it's an emergency and there's not really a joy in that it's just well it's an emergency and then everybody's upset and excited and all of that and then what happens if somebody doesn't come and there are times like that aren't there when somebody doesn't come do you get mad as if you deserved it? Well, they should have come. After all, do we get mad at God as if he owes us? Even though sometimes it might be our fault. Let me just direct you to Jesus in the wilderness. 40 days of prayer and God didn't come. Satan did. He showed up. But his whole intention was, Jesus, that you go through this and not that I save you from it. And so that may be what happens in times in our life as well. Jesus at the cross is the same thing, and he cries to God about being forsaken. And he's right. God's not coming. Because it's important that he goes through this. And so sometimes I think it gets to that stage. One of the better ones that we see is in the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. And I just want to take the, the one part where you realize that he goes and he takes his fortune and he spends everything that he had and a severe famine arose in the country and he began to be in need. And so he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs, and he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. And then this line, and no one gave him anything. There was no help. So what do you do when there's no help? I mean, sure, it's your fault. You've been out there, you've done the things that are wrong, and it's your fault, and now God's not coming. And so you cry for help. I hate pig food. They get mad when I eat it because then the pigs get skinny. No, that's not right. But 
But I mean, that's where he is. He's in this situation. And so when you look at what he does, he can't, no one is coming to help him. And his solution is very unique because he says, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go to my father and I'm going to admit my fault. And then I'm going to ask to be a servant. I'm not going to ask to be a son. I'm just going to say, can I get a job? That's the help I need. Can I get a job as a servant in your house? Because I know what your servants are like, and they get to eat. And I'm not even getting to eat now. And he knows it's his fault, and he still goes back and he asks for help. And, of course, the response is tremendous. However, God doesn't give him any money, and I don't know that you know, he's ever given that, but he lives without inheritance in the Father's house. So I'm not sure he needs the money. He no longer needs that because he has what he really wanted, help. I think there's common reasons why we don't ask. Let me give you some. So five reasons. First one is the fear of being a burden. I don't want to bother anybody. You know, they, uh, they have all the things that they have to do and they have too much on their plate already. You ever heard that expression? has nothing to do with food, whatever. It just means I don't want to bother because, you know, they've got better things to do. That's another way of saying that. We don't want to admit that we're out of control and that we lost control of our life somewhere. Sometimes you see this with relationships that go bad. You see certainly this with addiction that goes bad. You see this when things get out of hand with finances, and we don't want to admit that we're out of control. So I'm just not going to ever ask for help because I don't want to admit that. I don't want to owe a favor. Because if you help me, then I might have to help you, and I don't want to help anybody. So I'm not going to ask for any help. I'm going to make sure that you know I don't want to feel indebted to people. Another one is a fear of appearing weak. I don't want to be needy. I don't want to be incompetent. I don't want to be broken. I don't want you to think I'm stupid or incapable. Of course, I am in the situation, so. But that's what happens sometimes. And then the last one is the fear of rejection. That maybe somebody already said no one time when you ask them. So you're not going to ask again. Do I need help? Yeah, I need help. But I'm not going to ask anymore because I've already been told no once. And I just couldn't stand that if that happens again. And I think sometimes that's what we see. There's a time when the disciples asked for help. And it's when Jesus had first called them. And so in Luke chapter 5, he had been teaching on the shore and he had gotten into the boat of Peter and Andrew. And so as they push out, he finishes teaching and he says, let down your nets for a catch. And it says in verse 6, And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking, and they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and they filled both boats so that they began to sink. They called for help. Right. Jesus is the problem, you'd realize. He gave them too much fish. But it, we can't just... You know, we've got too much fish in the net. Well, let some out. No, those are my fish. But your net's breaking. I know. I need help. Then let go of the net. It won't break. Let the fish go. I can't let the fish go. Those are my fish. You see how we get sometimes? And so they call the other people over. Here we are. We've got to get these fish. And now both boats are beginning to sink and both of the nets are beginning to break and they're trying to get all these fish in because after all, we've got these fish. Jesus gave us these fish. And they get to shore. And he says, now I want you to walk away. And they do. But they couldn't have walked away in the boat because we're desperate to get those fish. These are our fish. And we're desperate to get whatever success it is that we've got to have. And they probably had to count them all also and see how many were over 30 inches or whatever it is and how many big ones did we get this time. And 
we can't let go sometimes. And so we call for help. And certainly people are able to come and help because they recognize the importance of it all. And they recognize this is what it's all about. And then Jesus asks us to leave it. When you help other people, you help yourself. And so it's impossible to not feel great when you do good for other people. And I want you to remember that. So if you want to feel good this week, we'll see you at Harvest Festival. Because that's the way your week, week is going to go, and you're going to feel really good. You might be a little tired, but uh, you're going to feel really good if you're able to come and help. Yeah, you think I did this whole sermon just for that. That's, that's really not the reason. It just seems that we need this time of sharing. Uh, Thanksgiving's going to be coming up. We're going to pass out the turkey dinners again. You've, I've seen the bags for El Salvador. That's one of those quiet ones that goes around. Nobody really knows, but I see them coming in, and some people taking them, and uh, they're filling those bags. You guys helped with hurricane relief. You guys help with all kinds of things. You do a great job in helping. And any time, that's, that's one of the things that's so good about this congregation. So let me tell you how we do things, and you probably already know this, but this is just the way it is here. Money, of course, is very limited, and so we help members at times when they need help. And this is speaking financial. Uh, we just don't have the funds to help everybody, and we get multiple calls every day. Uh, there isn't a day when we don't have multiple calls asking for uh, rent or, or utilities or something that needs financial support. And it's always financial. Uh, and even for members, we don't give away money. We pay the bill. And so we may help with that. Now, one thing that we do have for everybody, members and everyone that wants, is a grocery bag because we want people to be able to eat. The first one we ask, it's free, you can come in, you can pick it up at any time. It's food for you to cook, though. It's not gonna be junk food, it's gonna be more what you have to have to live on uh, more than anything else. And then you need to come back on the second Saturday with pantry and sign up. And you can get one that goes for six months and you can get a bag every month. And hopefully that will give you some money for some other things and hopefully that will allow you to eat and be able to take care of things that way. Um, it is not intended for long-term support. It's just intended for a few things. Paul Garrison's the deacon that handles all that. Paul is right here. Don't shake your head at me. <laughs> You're the main guy with all of this. And so any other needs that we have, we'll send you to Paul because he is all wise and uh, knows how to help people in some situations. Um, and if you want to help people, what we will do is we'll send out an email asking this person needs a ride to the doctor. It's not financial. If you got extra time, just respond to the email. Of course, that means you have to be on our email list. And so if you're not on our email list, you're not gonna know that somebody needed a ride to the doctor somebody needs help moving something or somebody needs help on this and so we're not going to post it on the bulletin board so and so is terrible and awful and needs help uh, that's just not going to be that way we're going to keep those private you're not going to read it in the bulletin but you might get an email and so let me encourage you if you're not on the email list to get an email and if you don't have an email then you can always call the church office but i'm not sure getting 400 calls a day of can I help you with anything? I'm not sure that's going to be good either. I've had some people say that uh, I can help with this if you ever run into that situation. So if you want to let us know that, we'll try and make sure that we've got a list of things that we know that you're able to help with because this is one of the things Jesus did. And it's one of the things where we need to excel and we need to be really good at it. And our culture has changed so much that it's very difficult to really find that helping is a matter of faith. A lot of times it's not. But I know our people, and it is. 
it is a matter of faith and it needs to be done that way and whether we help or whether you ask for help both are a matter of faith and you find God responding over and over and over again in that uh, one of the ones that you know so well is in Acts 3 where Peter and John are going to the temple and the man asks for alms well he's there for support I mean he's there for long term he can't do anything else that's all he has and Peter says, I don't have any money, but I'll give you what I have. And what he has is healing. And that's all we need to do is to give what we have. And if what you have is time, if what you have is money, if what you have is expertise, if what you have is just a phone call, we don't need to be ashamed that we don't have more. But we just need to use what we have to be able to give. Let me share with you a story that I saw. A friend came to visit and they showed me an exquisite handmade dress she just bought for her granddaughter at a local boutique. And when I told her how much I loved it, she asked if I'd like to get one for my granddaughter. And I said, sure. And before I could get, but I'm not able to go shopping out of my mouth, she was out the door. She returned shortly with a dress in two sizes for me to choose from, and I picked one. She wrote her check, and when she left to go home, she took the one I didn't want back to the boutique. That made three trips for her in the same day to that store. When I got sick, was she one of the people who had said, let me know if there's anything I can do to help? Yeah, but I'd never ask her to do anything. And on that day, however, I saw in her face that going to get that dress was a gift for me to her. She can't restore my health, but she can buy a dress for me, and I can give it to my granddaughter, and doing it made her feel terrific. And I think that's where we are sometimes, is we need to feel good, and we need the opportunity to feel good where you can really help someone, and it makes a difference. So two questions for you today to end. Can we be a person who helps? Are there things you have that you can do to help other people? Do they need to ask, or do you want to find them, or just help with what you have? You know what you have. Are you willing to share it? Are you willing to be able to help? And the last one is, can you ask for help? Sometimes that's kind of difficult. We have to admit that we didn't know how to handle life and we can come up with one of those excuses and maybe it isn't critical now and so we'll put it off and we'll wait and we'll wait till, oh, okay, so now it's a terrible, awful thing. And You know what, sometimes you just need to say, I could use some help with this and it builds a relationship with someone else who's able to help. It doesn't need to come through the church office. It can just be between you guys. Because after all, that's the basis of Christianity, isn't it? We want to be able to help people who struggle with sin. And we need to help them find the redemption and the forgiveness that they need. Because after all, that's what help is all about. We don't support sin but we do have help because of Jesus. And he's helped many times. And he may have to help us a lot of times, even with the same thing. And shouldn't we be embarrassed and ashamed? But he's the only place. And so we go back to him over and over again because he's the one that died for us. He's the one that gave up his life for us. And do you think for a minute He'd say, yeah, you've had enough. I don't want to give you any more. No, I don't think he's like that at all. I think he's the one that says, just come back. And sometimes we might have to get ourselves up and travel back and be able to admit, I messed up in my life. And I need help. And he's the one who can. Maybe this morning you need that help. We're glad to be able to try and do what we can and to help you. 
we're glad to pray to Jesus for you because he's the one that really gives help. Would you come while we stand and sing?